Good morning. We are glad you tuned in to our service this morning. We are going to start with a call to worship, which is out of Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me and the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in the midst, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Praise him, 
whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of Let's uh, <clears throat> open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, it is a good and joyful thing uh, to give thanks to you. Uh, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When captive to fear and oppression, you continued to be our sovereign God. Indeed, our souls can be still and know that you are God, that there is no other. By your great mercy, God, we have been born anew to a, a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead. And to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Now as your people, we boldly declare your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us to freedom, to life, and to wholeness. God, we thank you for your great faithfulness to us in all situations. We ask that uh, you would walk with us and with those for whom we pray this day, that your grace and mercy may sustain our faith and our hope. We pray for those affected by the mass shooting in Nova Scotia this past weekend. Our hearts break for the families and friends of the victims. Comfort those in need with your love and with your peace that passes all understanding. We pray for children and young people who must think about the future in these uncertain times. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that whatever threats and challenges they may face, their lives matter to you. We pray for the elderly and the disabled in our community as social isolation continues. Uh, give each one a, a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them where their gifts are needed and how much they matter to you. We, we pray for those affected by this economic crisis as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Give wisdom and courage to those uh, leading us through these challenges. May you bring about restoration and hope for the future. Uh, we pray for this congregation. In a time when we cannot gather together in person, keep us united to one another in your spirit. Use us in ways we may not even yet imagine, to respond to uh, those around us with the love and mercy we see in Jesus Christ. As we come now to your word, God, uh, make us attentive and attuned to what you have for us today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, worshiping with us and for for s your your singing. Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, if you can grab a Bible, uh, we are going to be in um, Mark chapter eleven, looking at verses twenty-seven to Mark chapter twelve and verse twelve. So uh, a good uh, chunk for our time together this morning. Uh, if you didn't know that our household uh, was big into hockey, before I tell you this story, uh, you are about to find out now. Uh, this past week, uh, Liam and I watched Alexander Ovechkin and Wayne Gretzky play in this online NHL 20 matchup. This, this wasn't a real hockey game. Uh, this was simply two hockey players uh, playing against each other on a video game. 
so that that's how uh, into hockey we we are as a family. We we watch people play video games on TV. Uh, now, in all fairness, uh, they were raising money for their respective charities, so it wasn't like it was a complete waste. Uh, but they, um, they they were making a big deal about this game uh, because Ovechkin is catching up to Gretzky's all-time goal-scoring record, so they wanted to see who is the greatest of all time by playing this this video game. Uh, what they did is they live-streamed the whole thing so that viewers like us could uh, tune in and watch them play. And Liam and I, we, re we really got into it. Uh, we were cheering when a team scored, and... Uh, we were uh, nervous about who was going to win, and, and it was actually a lot of fun for us, even though it wasn't a real, a real game. Uh, but one, the the one downside uh, was that these guys were uh, mic'd up, so so kind of like how <coughs> how I am, which meant that uh, we could hear everything they said <laughs> uh, throughout the game. Uh, Ovechkin would keep keep saying uh, Jesus, and at one point Liam asked why why he kept saying that. Why why does he keep saying Jesus. And so Helene and I explained to Liam that not everyone respects the name of Jesus because they don't know Jesus. And Liam in his uh in his childlike faith said everyone knows Jesus. And, and you know there there is truth to that statement. I, I believe that most people know about Jesus. They they might know something he said or or they might know th some of the things he he did, uh, but they don't actually know Jesus. It's essentially what this sermon series in Mark has been about. You, you see, it's easy uh, for us to know about Jesus and all the miracles he performed and, and the things that, that he said, but do we actually know Jesus? That, that's the question. And what makes the difference between knowing Jesus and simply knowing uh, about Jesus is, is whether or not we have submitted to his authority. And this is exactly what lies before us in our passage of Scripture for uh, our time together this morning. Jesus is once again going to enter the temple in, in Jerusalem, and his authority is going to be challenged by the Jewish leaders. And this morning, <coughs> we are going to be uh, challenged ourselves as to whether or not we have submitted to the authority of Jesus, and so that's that's what we're going to be looking at for our time together this morning. But uh, I'm just going to read our passage for us, and then we will dive in. Mark chapter 11, uh, beginning in verse 27. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, "By what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them?" Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Well, then why did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent to them another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another. And him they killed. And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. 
Have you not read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, Jesus clearing out the temple. Uh, the Jewish leaders, they had made the temple, which was supposed to be a place of prayer for uh, the nations, uh, for the Gentiles. Uh, but they had made the temple uh, a den of robbers, where uh, there, there were now sketchy dealings being done in the temple in order to support temple operations. And as Jesus comes across a fig tree uh, that had the appearance of bearing fruit, but with nothing but leaves on it, he likens that fig tree to the Jewish leaders who had the appearance of godliness, but who did not have the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, it's at this point that we would expect Jesus to uh, go into hiding, uh, as it were, uh, as the Jewish leaders would have been watching and waiting for him. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus goes right back into the city of Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he gets there, there is an immediate confrontation with the chief priests and the scribes and the, the elders, these, these three groups of religious leaders. And they ask Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Now these things, they're, they're obviously talking about the clearing of, <coughs> of the temple. Uh, but this has gone, gone way back uh, to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But notice that the Jewish leaders, they, they don't question whether or not Jesus has authority. They know full well that Jesus has some kind of authority to be able to, to say what he says and do what he does. They, they've been following him around since the beginning of his ministry. Uh, we initially encountered the authority of Jesus back in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and the crowd was astonished because Jesus taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes, who didn't have that kind of authority that Jesus had. Right, so they, the crowds, the people even noticed this already back at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But then later we see Jesus casting demons out of people, which means that Jesus has authority over the demonic forces. We saw that Jesus has the uh, authority to heal, but then in Mark chapter 2, we see that Jesus also has authority on earth to forgive sins. Uh, in Mark chapter 3, we saw that Jesus has authority over Satan himself uh, when he talks about uh, binding the strong man. Uh, and then in Mark chapter 4, we saw that Jesus has authority over the natural forces when he calms a storm. Uh, we've seen Jesus uh, have authority over, uh, over the, the scriptures and over the, the traditions of, of, uh, of the elders and the scribes and the, the religious leaders. Uh, and then last week, we looked at how Jesus has uh, authority even over the temple itself. Over and over again, Jesus is showing that he has, he has all authority and that all things are in subjection to him. And what must, must have been quite disconcerting for the Jewish leaders is that in, in every single one of these incidents, Jesus is saying or doing uh, things that only God can say or do. Such authority can only come from God, and yet Jesus seems to possess such authority. And, and so they, they ask, who gave you this Authority. They, they wanted Jesus to attribute the authority to God so that they could trap him in uh, blasphemy. But what does Jesus do? Instead, he answers their question with a question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Now, we might find this question to be rather odd. What does the, the baptism of John have to do with the authority of Jesus? In, in fact, they, they have a lot uh, to do with each other uh, because it's actually at the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist that we see where the authority of Jesus comes from. If you turn back to Mark chapter 1, uh, right near the beginning there, Jesus comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. In verse 10, uh, it says that uh, when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now the Jewish leaders, 
uh, they, they could discredit or try to discredit the baptism of Jesus by saying that John's baptism was simply from man. Right? It was just something that John invented himself. But then they would have been in trouble with the thousands of people. They had regions coming from all over the place to John uh, the Baptist to be baptized, believing him to be a prophet. And the Jewish leaders, they wanted the crowds on their side if they were going to get rid of this Jesus. So obviously that, that option didn't work. But on the other hand, if the Jewish leaders said that John's baptism was from heaven, well, then Jesus would want to know, he would want to know uh, why they didn't believe in him in the first place. Jesus really has them in a, in a no-win situation. There's no way really for them to get out of this conversation with their dignity intact. But the three groups of religious leaders, they come together and they discuss the implications of this question. And they decide that there's o- really only one way that they can answer this question. And that is by saying to Jesus, we do not know. And, and the fact is that that is an absolute lie. Uh, of course, they know from where John's baptism came. They just don't want to admit it. Because it will either mean obedience to the authority of Jesus or opposition with the majority of the people. Neither option is good for them. The truth is staring them directly in the face. They simply refuse to see it. It was like what I shared a couple of weeks ago on Easter Sunday about the, uh, the temple guards who came to the Jewish leaders with the report uh, that Jesus had risen from the dead. The Jewish leaders want to, to cover it up, not because they didn't believe that Jesus uh, had risen from the dead, but precisely because he had risen from the dead and they did not want it to be true. The Jewish leaders here are confronted with the authority of Jesus. At some point, we all are, but in this moment, they, they find themselves face to face with the authority of Jesus. They, they know exactly from where it comes, but they refuse to acknowledge it. They had divine confirmation at, at uh, Jesus' baptism of his authority, but they, they disregard that. They, they know about Jesus and all the things pointing to his divinity, but they don't want it to be true. They don't actually know Jesus because that would mean an entire upheaval of their way of life. It would change their thinking forever. And so they say, we do not know. It's, it's a complete lie, but it's all they can really muster up so as to not bend the knee to King Jesus. So Jesus responds, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus is unwilling to commit himself to those who are, will not commit to him. But then Jesus tells a, a parable, an interesting parable that somehow ties into what's going on here. The parable of the tenants. It's a story of a landowner who leases a vineyard to tenant farmers to work in his absence. This was a, a popular thing in, in uh, these days. And at harvest season, he sends out, the, the landowner sends out a, a servant to uh, collect his, his produce. He was the landowner after all and was entitled to uh, his portion of the harvest. It acted as kind of rent money. But as one commentator put it, the tenants paid their rent in blows. It says that they took the servant, then beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Other servants are sent, receiving the same or worse treatment. Some are beaten, some are killed. As a last resort, the landowner sends his, his son, his only son. Surely his son will command respect from the tenant farmers. One commentator notes, in sending the servants, the owner appealed to the integrity of the tenants. He was expecting them to, expecting them to do the right thing. In sending his son, he appeals to the right of law. For the son was the only person, save himself, who possessed legal claim over the vineyard. And the son differs from the slaves in several important respects. They are many, He is unique. They are hirelings, perhaps even themselves property. He is the heir. They are forerunners. He is the last and final word of the Father. Above all, the Son is beloved. The Son would go 
with the father's authority to the father's property to claim the father's due. If the tenants rejected the authority of the son, well, then they were rejecting the authority of the father, the landowner himself. Sure enough, no longer content with the landowner's produce, the tenants now go after the whole property. They think to themselves, if, if we kill the son, then we will become the heirs, and the property, the inheritance will be ours. And that's what they do. They killed the son and threw him out of the vineyard. And at this point, the landowner intervenes decisively, destroying the tenants and then leasing the property to others more deserving. It's an interesting parable. What are we to make of it? How does this parable fit in with what's going on in this moment? Because as we looked at last week, Jesus doesn't do things without purpose. There's an intention here of Jesus. What, what exactly is going on? Well, turn, turn over to Isaiah chapter 5, if you have your Bibles open. Uh, Isaiah chapter 5. There's a, a deeper meaning behind this story, and it's found in the words of God in Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 6. And it says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall, be, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So it's, it's, this passage in Isaiah sounds very much like the parable that Jesus told. And we see from this passage in Isaiah how God deals with the people of Israel like a vineyard. He gives them good laws and brings them to a good land and leases his vineyard to good tenants. In this case, the Jewish leaders. They were supposed to look after the vineyard so that it would produce a crop of good grapes. But it produces only bad fruits. God had given them everything they needed to be fruitful, but the Jewish leaders had failed in their assignments. So God sent the prophets to them. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But just like the servants in the parable, the Jewish leaders mistreated the prophets of God. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 26 says, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Jeremiah 20 verse 2 tells us that Jeremiah was beaten and put in stocks. Tradition tells us that the prophet Isaiah was sawn in two. 2 Chronicles 24 21 says that they stoned a prophet by the name of Zechariah to death in the court of the temple. And most recently, John the Baptist, a prophet in his own right, had been beheaded. Jesus himself laments the actions of the Jewish leaders in Matthew 23, verse 37, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. The Jewish leaders had defiantly rebelled against God, the rightful owner of the vineyard. They took the good things of God and made them ultimate things, thus making them bad things. They took what was God's and said it was theirs. At last... God the Father would send his beloved son with his authority 
to claim what was rightfully his, to claim his due. God himself became flesh and dwelt among them, but was not believed. John chapter 1 verse 11 says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. The Jewish leaders reject the Son of God, and they are rejecting the very one who sent him, God the Father himself. But they do worse than that. They do worse and reject the Son. The Jewish leaders would take the Son of God, and they would kill him, and they would put him out of the vineyard, so to speak, so that they could have the vineyard for themselves. And it's here where we see what Romans 11.22 calls the kindness and the severity of God. We see the kindness and the severity of God. We we see the kindness of God towards his people in sending them the prophets and eventually his only son. We, We cannot comprehend such love as to want to woo your people back so badly that you just send prophet after prophet after prophet. They keep on uh, mistreating them and killing them. And I feel like if I were the landowner in this parable, or I would have intervened much sooner. But God is, is gracious. He's long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, according to Second Peter 3, verse 9. So we see the, the kindness of God, but we also see the severity of God expressed in verse 9. The question is asked, what will the owner of the vineyard do? What will God do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. You know, we, we like to talk about the kindness of God, but we don't like to talk as much about the severity of God. And yet we must. And yet we must. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says that there, there is uh, salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is judgment coming for those who reject the Son of God. The severity of God is made clear here. Salvation can only be found. In the Son of God, in Jesus. And to, to reinforce this point, Jesus quotes from uh, Psalm 118, verses 22 to 23, which says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the, the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And indeed, Jesus would be the, the stone that the builders rejected but he would become the cornerstone. He'd be raised to life on the third day and would become the the pinnacle and the foundation of our faith. And we know that this is the Lord's doing. We know that is the, the plan of God from before the foundation of the world. We know that, that his ways are perfect. We know that he is a good father, but how How is the rejection of Jesus, the the only Son of God, marvelous in our eyes? Is the question we have. And it's marvelous in our eyes because the Son of God was killed on our behalf. He was killed on our behalf. You see, we are no different than the the wicked tenants in the parable or or even the the, uh, the Jewish leaders that, uh, that are confronting Jesus. Romans 8 verse 7 says that, uh, the, the, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. There's, there is no part of our natural selves that desires to submit to the authority of God. We are at war with God from the moment we are conceived. What we need is a change of hearts. We, we can have all the facts before us. We can, we can know that we are that we are wrong, but unless the Spirit of God transforms our hearts, we will not submit to the authority of God. This was the case for the Jewish leaders. They knew that Jesus told the parable against them. They knew that they and their forefathers were the tenants, 
who were supposed to give God his due. They knew that their forefathers had shamefully treated the servants of God, uh, beating some and killing some. They knew that they themselves were planning the greatest act of rebellion that they could have ever committed, where, where they were about to kill the beloved Son of God. They knew all of this, and yet they would not repent. What they needed was the Spirit of God to transform their heart. They needed the change of heart so that they would submit to the authority of God. What we're seeing here is an issue of, with authority. We're seeing an issue with authority. And it's not just a, an issue for uh, the Jewish leaders. It's not just an issue... Um, 2,000 years ago. This is something that every human being uh, has wrestled with since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to uh, this very day. Uh, the first man and the first woman were told, uh, eat of this fruit and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that sounds nice. They, they figured that meant they uh, would no longer have a standard to live up to. They figured that meant they would uh, no longer be accountable to anyone. They figured uh, that meant they would uh, be the master of their fate and the captain of their soul. And yet we still wrestle with authority, don't we? If I can be completely honest, when Dina Hinshaw announced this week uh, that there would be no mass gatherings allowed over the summer, uh, I found it diff very difficult to submit to her authority. I'm I'm personally tired of uh, the isolation. I'm sh I'm sure uh, you uh, you might feel the same way. Uh, maybe you find it difficult when a political party gets voted into power that you don't that you didn't vote for that you don't like. Now maybe you find it difficult to um, to do what your boss at work tells you to do. Maybe you uh, wrestled with some of the decisions of your parents growing up. All of these instances simply reveal to us that, that we don't have all authority, like, like we are tempted to believe that we have, and that we actually have an issue with those in authority over us. But there is one who does have all authority and in whom we can take comfort knowing that all things are ultimately in his hands. And his name is Jesus. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, just before he's about to ascend to heaven, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Yeah, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. I listened to a podcast by uh, John, Pastor John Piper this past week where he talked about the scope of the authority of Jesus. And here is the, the authority of Jesus. Jesus has all authority over Satan and all demons and all angels, good and evil. Authority over the natural universe, natural objects and laws and forces like stars and galaxies and planets and meteorites. Authority over all weather systems, winds and rains and lightning and thunder and hurricanes and tornadoes and monsoons and typhoons and cyclones and all their effects like tidal waves and floods and fires. All authority over molecular and atomic reality, atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons, subatomic particles, quantum physics, DNA, chromosomal uh, reality. All plants, all animals, doesn't matter what size, whales, redwood, uh, giant squids, giant oaks, all fish, all wild beasts, he has authority over. All invisible animals, bacteria and viruses, Yes, even coronaviruses and parasites and germs of every kind he has authority over. He has authority over all the parts and functions of the human body, every beat of your heart, every movement, movement of the diaphragm, every little jump uh, across the, the million synapses in your brain. Jesus has authority over all those 
physiological phenomena in your body. He has all authority over nations and governments and congresses and legislatures and kings and premiers and courts. He has all authority over armies and weapons and bombs and terrorists, all authority over industry and business and finance and currency, all authority over entertainment and amusement and leisure and media, all authority over education and research and science and discovery, all authority over crime and violence in all families and all neighborhoods, and he has authority over his body, the church. And he has authority over every soul in the universe and every moment and every second of every life lived now or previously or forever and ever anywhere in the universe. Jesus has all authority. He has died. He has risen from the dead. He has triumphed over sin and death fully, finally, and forever. The question is not whether or not Jesus has all authority. He does the, the question is whether we will submit to his authority or whether we will reject his authority. That's the question. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11 says that God has exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We might reject the authority of Jesus, but there is not a square inch in all of creation that Christ does not have rightful claim. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. How will we respond to his authority? How will we respond to his authority? Here's the reality for us. We, we are naturally rebels against the authority of our creator God. We want to be our own God. We, we want to be our own authority. We want to be able to do what we want to be able to do with no one telling us otherwise. We, we have taken the good things of God and we've made them ultimate things, thus making them bad things. We've rebelliously taken what was God's and made it ours. But Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and I quote this often because it's beautiful, so that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebels, while we were still shaking our fists at God and his authority, Christ died for us. The Son of God stood in our place where we rebelled against God and sought autonomy for ourselves, thus incurring the judgment of God against us in our state of rebellion, Jesus stood in our place, willingly giving himself over to death, taking the judgment of God that was rightfully coming our way upon himself so that we could be saved. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know, there, there will be many who will reject the good news. There are many who will not respect the name of Jesus or submit to his authority. There are many who will know all the facts about Jesus, but who don't actually know Jesus. And my hope is that we will see and believe and give our lives to the one who was rejected and killed so that we could be saved. When it says that um, he will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Um, the vineyard has been given to all those who put their faith in Jesus. We are 
ushered in to the family of God as sons of God, children of God, daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. This, this is the good news. This is the gospel. John 3, verse uh, 16 and 18 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And, and many people stop here. And we could stop here. But Jesus continues, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Again, we could stop here and that would be great. No condemnation. Salvation through Jesus. Awesome. But Jesus continues with verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It seems like during this time, uh, Christ is stripping everything away. So that what is left is trust in him. It's as though he's asking us, am I king over your finances? Am I king over your health? Am I king over your job? Am I king over your family? Am I king over how you spend your time? Am I king over your life? I've definitely been wrestling all week with preaching this sermon. This isn't the, the passage. Uh, this isn't a passage of scripture I, I like very much right now because it's exposing all kinds of insecurities in me. Jesus says, whoever does not believe is condemned already. We, we stand fully condemned before a holy and just and rightfully condemning God. If it were not for the intercession of Christ on our behalf, we would have no hope. But as such, Jesus has taken that condemnation upon himself for us. And so our believing in Jesus is where salvation comes. We, we need to take a, a hard look at our lives to see if we believe believe, not just have a little bit of Jesus on the side. You know, I claim to follow Christ, but then my life looks completely different, like what we looked at last week. This is belief in Jesus. This is, this is bowing down to the authority of Jesus, where, where everything in my life comes under his authority and reign, and I fully submit it to him. I give it over to him. Because if Christ is not king over every area of our lives and he is not king at all. If Christ is not king over every area of our lives then he's not king at all. And, and what, what authority does Christ have? He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He is king over all. And until we trust him with every aspect of our lives, until we have submitted to the authority of Jesus, not, not waiting until judgment day when we will bow down before him, but submitting to the authority of Jesus today, until we do that, then we will, we really will not know Jesus. Until we do that, we really will not know Jesus, and I hope we do. I pray we do. And I pray that as we, we wrestle with the authority of, of Jesus, that we would come to him with, with everything we've got, whatever we've got, and, and submit <coughs> to his authority 
his rule and his reign because he is king over all of creation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the person of Jesus Christ who was rejected by his own people so that we could be accepted in your sight. We thank you for the Holy Spirit by which our eyes are opened to see our own sinfulness and and to see your absolute holiness. Forgive us, God, when we try to make claims of ignorance claiming that we don't know when in fact we do know. Give us the grace to bow down lower than ever before the authority of Jesus and to embrace him as Lord and Savior rather than bowing to him one day when we will meet him as our judge. May we find your work of grace marvelous in our eyes. May we uh, find comfort in the all-encompassing authority of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our uh, benediction is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.